Hello, this is Dennis Williams, and this is Meaning and History, and today we're talking about trade in the ancient world. Hey folks, this is Dennis Williams, and I am here today to talk about trade in the ancient world, and really today is just answering your questions. Uh, and so I got a number of questions in about trade uh, and uh, in, in ancient times, and so here are the questions that you ask. Does trade have the same benefits today as it did in ancient times? And uh, so I, I think we ought to ask the question, what's the benefit of trade anyway? And so first of all, I think we ought to think about trade in terms of the transmission of goods and ideas and genetic material uh, across distance. Okay, so that could be a short distance, uh, trading livestock, uh, trading uh, manufactured goods, trading food, uh, maybe just sharing an idea with your neighbor and that idea, you know, prompts your neighbor to do something different. All of those are, are types of transactions. Now, when we start talking about business transactions, we're talking about taking that genetic material, whether it's food or, or people or whatever it is, and transferring it in exchange for something else. And that exchange could be in barter, maybe you know, other types of products, uh, or it could be in money. And money is a development that comes along uh, in civilization after the initial trade being bartered, goods back and forth. You know, I want something of yours, you want something of mine, we make a deal, we trade for it. Uh, but money becomes, uh, or coin, uh, becomes this interesting uh, sort of product that stands in for value. And so people can trade a coin for a product, and then you know whoever then has that coin can trade it for another product. And so money becomes an important feature for uh, moving goods, uh, maybe ideas, uh, uh, produce, those kinds of things across distances where people don't exactly have ex the precisely the, the desired product. It also means that over greater distances, goods can be transported um, for maybe luxury goods that come from away far away, that money can go with it. And so you don't have to travel with you know, big herds of cattle or you know, giant sacks of wheat just to get some good 50 or 60 miles away or, or, or 1,000 miles away. Instead, you can take that small coin and do the same thing. And so that was one of the developments for uh, trade and business in the ancient world. And certainly that is, uh, a benefit then, it's a benefit now. Of course, we do a lot of that with electronic money today, uh, where we you know, don't carry around the cash, but we carry around a card that then connects to an electronic system and makes that, that, that trade through that form of electronic currency. Uh, but that's something we still, that's just a, an evolution of the, the coin that was once carried around. Uh, so that facilitates movement of wealth uh, back and forth across uh, distance. It, uh, it also, uh, trade also was a, a way of extending political power. So when you extended the boundaries of a kingdom or the boundaries of an empire, oftentimes what happened inside that boundary was that trade traveled freely. Uh, people were able to, to move goods back and forth without paying tariffs and those kinds of things. And so that was a benefit, certainly, of the expansion of political boundaries. Uh, and with empires, uh, the expansion of those political boundaries grew quite large. And as they grew large, uh, that facilitated the movement of goods, material, people, ideas, technology, all of those sorts of things throughout this larger empire as people moved around in the empire to take advantage of various and sundry opportunities. And as a result of that, uh, we see increases in creativity and innovation as new ways of thinking about things are passed through trade networks uh, by individuals who come from different cultures. And so the diversity created by, by extensive trade leads for the, the, to the transfer of new ideas uh, into new places and people are putting those ideas together in unique ways and coming up with something remarkable and creative. Uh, and in the absence of long distance trade, in the absence of people communicating uh, around business deals, uh, you see a, a kind of a, a, of a slump in people's ability to think creatively or garner new ideas because those ideas kind of just exist within a particular worldview and that worldview is limited and there's not a lot of, of intercourse back and forth between different cultures and as a result not as much creativity. So today our global trade networks uh, certainly encourage creativity and innovation and the more people are outside of those networks the more limited their new ideas and their creativity and innovation often is. So I would say that in the ancient world, create uh, uh, business transactions, trade over distance, created a, a lot of opportunities for transfer of wealth, getting new ideas, uh, 
new types of genetic stock in the trade of food, uh, people, uh, animals, those sorts of things, and also uh, created creativity and innovation opportunities. It does the same today. So the next question was about language. And so we start thinking about, you know, part of, of trade is being able to actually communicate. Like I have a good and you have a good, and so let's, let's make a trade. Uh, and how do we negotiate that trade? And so language barriers with the multitude of different languages would become problematic. In fact, when we look at Mesopotamian mythology, one of the things that we find, and it's recorded in the uh, in Jewish scriptures, we find this this uh, this story of the Tower of Babel, in which you know it seemed like all the people of the world spoke one common language, and they were able to to as a result of speaking one common language, they were able to you know coordinate their efforts. Um, they were able to direct the energy of civilization, and they were going to build this, this tall tower that would go all the way up into the heavens. And uh, as, as it reached heaven, kind of like Jack and the Beanstalk, the people could climb up there, conquer God, and become gods themselves, I suppose. And of course, God sitting in heaven, the great sky god, looks down at this and says, that's not a good idea. And so he curses the people for their ambition and divides them by making them all speak different languages. And so they were confused and they couldn't, you know, organize and, and coordinate activities and civilization fell apart. So that story, I think, is just suggestive then of the, the importance of finding some kind of common language. And certainly trade, commerce, is based on the ability to make those kinds of transactions. Today, of course, one of the ways that we do, you know, sort of trade is by using numbers. You know, it's sort of the math of things. So, you know, little ticker symbols and then a, a number of, you know, dollars or yuan or uh, yen or whatever the, 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 the currency is, you know, enables people to trade on the stock market even if they can't speak the same uh, language, even if it's, you know, between Asia and Europe. And maybe there's nobody speaking the same language, but those little symbols do the trick. And that's a kind of a common language. But when we think back to uh, people's people's negotiation uh, around, you know, well, I've got, you know, 20 cows and I would like to, you know, buy wheat from you and I'll make a trade. If you can't really communicate that, it's tougher. So one of the things that happens is that people develop a trade language, kind of a, a, of a creole or a pidgin language. Uh, in the Middle Ages, it was called the lingua franca, uh, the language of the Franks, who were these sort of barbaric people up in Western Europe. Uh, who you know traveled around and 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 did deals um, among other things, but that notion of lingua franca, that common language where people perhaps speak their own language at home, maybe they're really really fluent actually in their own particular home language, but they've got enough words, enough vocabulary in a, in, in this third language sitting out here that they can talk to other people just enough to do business. Like me myself, I wish I could speak Spanish fluently, but I can't. Uh, I grew up in a pretty Hispanic uh, part of West Texas, but you know I kind of learned Spanish on the bus, um, and so I, I know some words, and probably they're not all that great to uh, to, to speak in polite company. Uh, but over time, I've picked up a little bit of Spanish, so that when I travel uh, in Spanish-speaking countries, you know I can I can order food, I can make basic transactions, I can carry on a, a little you know three-year-old conversation with someone, perhaps. Uh, just to kind of make a little bit of small talk and, you know, make human-to-human -human interaction. Uh, but I always think in the back of my mind, I wish I could speak Spanish better. One of the things that one would note then is that whenever you travel around the world, oftentimes there is sort of this sort of common language that people can speak. Today, in many parts of the world, that language is English. Uh, people speak English as sort of a pidgin language or a common language so that, you know, Germans, when they see Americans kind of speak English because they recognize that Americans probably can't speak German or any other language other than English for that matter. So that's one of the, 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 the things that people do. Sometimes those common languages are, are created uh, for you know, uh, uh, certain kinds of negotiations. Today, for instance, no matter where in the world you go, uh, airline pilots speak English when they're flying airplanes. The air traffic control systems of the world, the airports of the world, uh, they all operate on English. That doesn't mean that those pilots are fluent in English. It means that they can fly airplanes in English and they might do everything else in some other language. 
but that's a, 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 an example, I think, today where you might see a common language so that just governs a particular kind of activity that everybody who participates in that activity will speak that particular language. Certainly, that was true in the ancient world. So, in the Roman Empire, uh, in the western part of the Roman Empire, Latin was spoken as a trade language. So, there were lots of different tribal peoples who spoke their own languages, the Celts and others, but if they were going to do business with the Italians, they spoke enough Latin to do that business. In the eastern part of the Roman Empire, uh, in you know where the Roman Empire centered in what is today Turkey, the Byzantine part of the empire around Byzantium and Western Asia, people used Koine Greek as that sort of common language, that trade language where they interacted and they, they could speak to people who were not part of their tribe. When you go to South Asia, uh, there's, there's a combination language of Hindi and Urdu um, called Hindustani that becomes kind of a trade language there. If you go into Southern Africa, there are a number of Bantu peoples who speak a, a trade, common trade language called Swahili. And so these languages allow people of different tribes and different locations to do essential business with one another in this sort of common trade language. And oftentimes that trade language picks up or accumulates words from the different cultures that interact uh, together through that language. And we see that oftentimes in English because English is one of those sort of trade languages today. And so English, you know, amalgamates. It's always picking up a, a, an interesting word from someplace. We see it, you know, English picking up Spanish uh, all the time. So it's pretty common for people to, you know, have uh, fluency in all kinds of, of Hispanic foods like, you know, tacos and tortillas and, and things like that. Um, and also to, you know, just flippantly say like, uh, hey, amigo, how's it going? You know, or something like that. And that little word for friend, amigo, just kind of slips out and it becomes a natural part of, of American English, let's say, or something like that. And so that would be true for these other trade languages in the ancient times as well. They would pick up a lot of different kinds of, of words. And so there's a difference between reading sort of classical 5th century BC Greek, this sort of classical Greek that Homer's Iliad is written in, and then reading like the... The, the, the New Testament books of the Christians that are written in Koine Greek, which is sort of this common language of uh, common Greek language of the empire that picks up a lot of you know words, phrases, uh, grammar that might actually be associated with other um, other languages. You would see this also uh, with Arabic, for instance. And so Arabic, because it expands along with Islam, is the Arabic is the language of Islam. The Quran cannot be written. Uh, in any language other than um, other than Arabic, uh, and still be considered authoritative. And so you can have translations of the Quran, and that's fine. It's fine to get some understanding. But if you're really going to study the Quran, it's got to be studied in Arabic as its original language, because that's the language in which it was given to the Prophet Muhammad. And so as Arabic expanded south into, into Africa, across North Africa, over across in through South Asia and into Southeast Asia, and then even into, um, even into uh, Indonesia, uh, places like that, Arabic becomes a language that other Muslims speak with one another. And so a Muslim talking to another Muslim halfway across the world uses Arabic as maybe a common language, even though their home language may be some some very different other tribal local language. So language barriers are overcome by, in the end, a common trade language. And that trade language, of course, is facilitating trade and created by trade. So great question. So the next thing I want to talk about is, 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 is trade alliances. Somebody asked the question, so how do these trade alliances form? And somebody else said, you know, what happens when a trade goes bad? Does it create a war? Um, and so let's talk about that briefly. Uh, one thing to recognize is this, uh, businesses uh, do their best trade when there are win-win situations, right? When, when somebody has something that somebody else wants and what somebody else wants is reciprocated, everybody wins. It's a wonderful day. And so, you know, good trade happens when people are happy about the exchange of goods, money, whatever it is they're exchanging. If if, if the buyer wants it and is satisfied with the price and the seller wants it and is satisfied with the price, it's a happy day. So, you know, that's the way negotiations work best. Um, so, bad trades do happen. 
And oftentimes bad trades are sort of forced trades perhaps, you know, where I don't really want to sell you this for this price, but nobody else is buying and I got to sell, so I guess I'll sell it to you. Um, I feel bad about that. I, I don't like that. Or I feel like you might be taking advantage of me. Um, and that breeds distrust. And so bad trade negotiations are one where there's somebody, you know, using power perhaps or, you know, taking advantage of other people. And that will be remembered throughout time that, you know, you perhaps cheated me out of a good trade. And, and that becomes problematic and that can lead to, you know, really bad blood down the road. Um, the, the worst blood perhaps comes from, you know, two players playing against each other and using a common client um, state in between them to, you know, hack out their differences with one another. And oftentimes the, 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 the common client, that, you know, little country, that city, that person, you know, so who's in the middle of these two competitors, um, you know, feels good when they are cultivating him or, or it. But at the same time, that oftentimes goes awry when all of a sudden one of those competitors decides that they're going to control and not allow that, uh, that third party any freedom to trade with others. And so the absence of free trade comes from these sort of imperial kinds of conditions like that. And oftentimes that leads to the abuse of that third party in trade relationships. Um, one thing also to note is that oftentimes trade goes on even when there are political competitions, uh, even when there are, um, let's say, wars going on between empires, oftentimes there's still trade going on between those empires. There are merchants who are working their deals because there are goods in the one place that need to go to the other place and vice versa. And so oftentimes there might be high level conflict, uh, political conflict, and oftentimes economically things are working just fine. We see this a lot in the ancient and medieval world. And one good example of that is what's going on during that period of time in the, in the Middle Ages um, when there's this, this, this event called the Crusades happening, which wasn't just sort of one long continuous war, but a bunch of little wars that are kind of split apart by, you know, treaties of peace or just absence of hostility. In the midst of all of that, there are goods that are traveling from Asia to Europe um, across the Silk Road, um, at, going from sort of trader to merchant to trader to merchant to, you know, and, and sort of moving its way across. And the Arabs are the middlemen in this, or at least Muslim people are the middlemen in this, uh, this trade uh, thing that's going on here. And so there are certainly um, Christian Italians, for instance, who are merchants, who are buying goods from, you know, Arab merchants because they really want that saffron that's coming from, you know, Asia or something like that, or they really want that silk. Um, and so they're making a deal and they're making the best deal that they can make and they're probably happy about it. Now, would they like it if the, you know, if the Crusades successfully eradicated uh, Islam from, you know, the trade routes? Sure they would. But if it doesn't, okay, we'll just continue to do the trade. And of course that inspires then that Western uh, exploration that happens at the very end of the Middle Ages and you see the Portuguese sailing around Africa trying to circumvent this uh, Arab dominated trade uh, uh, culture in Western Asia or Columbus sailing east or shit sailing west trying to get to the east. Um, and so those are all a part of, a, of a, an attempt to you know get rid of the middleman, which is always what business is trying to do. But if you can't get rid of the middleman, then you just trade with the middleman. And um, so even though there might be political conflict, economics works okay. There might be economic conflicts and the politics may work okay. So, you know, there are bad deals, there are good deals, there are alliances that get built, uh, and those last as long as people are winning. And when people stop winning, oftentimes it becomes conflictual. So just something to note there. So uh, somebody else asked the question um, about quarantine and trade. So right now we're in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and borders have been closed and people are at stay at home and we're locking things down and the economy seems to just be completely disrupted by this because people can't go to work and they can't make money and restaurants can't sell, you know, can't seat people in the restaurant and, and, and therefore there are like um, uh, wait staff that are unemployed and so the economy seems to be really fragile, lots of things going on there. Um, 
Did that happen in history? And, and the answer to that is it did, certainly. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, the first example that I've been able to, to find about the closing of borders or quarantining places um, uh, against disease, the spread of disease, happened during the Middle Ages uh, at the time of the Black Death. So the Black Death is, is probably brought in, it's a, it's a bacillus that comes in with like fleas on rats uh, and you know probably just like embedded in carpets or something like that that are coming in from Western Asia and being traded into Europe. Um, the, the little flea off the rat bites people and then people get this disease. It's called the Black Death. Horrible thing. Um, it's spread both by blood and also by um, there's a kind of a pneumatic form that's spread by you know water droplets out you know breathing on people, coughing, sneezing, all those kinds of things. And one of the manifestations of the Black Death is that when you get it, you would get sort of these bullseye rashes on your underarms, uh, and then, you know, they would turn black and really bruised, and then you would die this sort of horrible, bloody death. Um, it was very, very contagious, killed lots and lots of people, couldn't hardly put a stop to it. And so in 1348, uh, the city of Venice in Italy, one of those trading cities, uh, the Black Death broke out there, and as a result, the uh, folks in Venice put us, you know, sort of quarantined anybody who looked like they might, of course, be uh, infected by the Black Death. And they also, um, you know, restricted movement of people. So if you were coming from afar, if you, you know, if you didn't have the right, you know, paperwork, that would be equivalent to a passport, perhaps now. Uh, they kept you out or they quarantined you into these various places to make sure that you weren't carrying the Black Death in. And this happens all over Europe then. You know, as people get scared of the transmission of the Black Death, which they well should have been, uh, they begin to quarantine places where there are outbreaks of the Black Death. Or they begin to restrict the movement of people who come from places who have where the Black Death outbreak is. And so what we're doing today with, uh, with uh, the COVID-19 uh, quarantines is very reminiscent of what was going on in the Middle Ages. Was that going on in other places and at other times? Surely could have been. Um, that was just an example that I was able to, to, to find, and, and it seems to be very appropriate for today. Um, let's see. So one other question was, could ancient civilizations have grown without long-distance trade, or without trade at all? And the answer is, well, I mean, yeah. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that that growth would have been slow and stunted, um, if at all. And I think there are examples of, uh, you know, peoples who, you know, tribes out in the middle of the Amazon or something like that that have had no contact with any, you know, modern civilization or something, and, and they still live in this very sort of hunted, hunter-gatherer kind of way. And so that might be an example of the, the sort of limits of growth without uh, the interaction that trade provides. Um, Certainly, if, if, if trade across cultures, if the diversity that, that comes along with that is not available to people, then folks are just limited to their local resources. You know, one of the things that trade does is it trades genes, it trades genetics, and so livestock and new plants and things like that are able to come along those trade routes. And so that provides opportunities to have, you know, access to new types of food. Uh, maybe new spices, but just maybe whole complete new types of, of more productive even food. And as a result of that, you know, that provides more available uh, carbohydrates, which leads to increases in population and increases in population lead to specialization, opportunity to specialize labor and opportunity to specialize labor leads to creativity, innovation, etc. And so without that, you would have a small limited society. Uh, grow, yeah, but flourish, grow big, become thriving, maybe not so much. Um, examples of how this works, though, is that, you know, Rome, as it began to expand outside of the Italian peninsula, creating an empire, uh, it conquers North Africa, um, you know, as, you know, Hannibal's armies of North Africa can't, you know, resist the uh, Italian conquest, ultimately, that's making that story really short, but as it, as that happens, uh, Rome is able to take hold of Northern Africa. As it takes hold of Northern Africa, it gains access to, the, to a lot of wheat growing land. And so the North Africans begin, as they grow their wheat, to trade north into Italy. Italian farmers no longer ha can grow wheat uh, profitably because the, 
the, the, the much larger farms in North Africa can produce it a lot cheaper, even with shipping. And as a result, Italian farmers begin to specialize in something else, grapes and olives and, and, and things like that. Or, or maybe they say, we can't even make a living here. So they become, you know, soldiers in the, uh, in, in the legions and they go, you know, conquer Britain or something like that. So uh, that, that specialization that trade makes possible for Northern Italy then just revolutionizes what then becomes possible in, in the, on the Italian peninsula. And it reshapes, really, um, the development of the Roman Empire through time. Um, I would say that another example from, a, from right at the very sort of end of our class as we move up against 1500 is going to be an example of a, of a product that comes from sub-Saharan Africa called gum arabic. It's the, it's the sap that comes out of a particular tree. That gum arabic becomes an important product in the development of printing. Uh, and so as, as the printing press is developed in the 1400s, um, one of the things that, that gum arabic is used for is for coating the, the blocks and making the ink stick to it so that the, print, the automatic printing press can actually function effectively which makes books then spread, which makes ideas then spread, etc. So without that long distance trade and the discovery of that gum Arabic and its use and, and somebody imagining what it could be done, what could be done with it and using it in printing, uh, you know, would have slowed down the uh, expansion of civilization, the growth of education and those kinds of things because we wouldn't have books uh, nearly as cheaply and, and available to us, um, which, you know, if we didn't have books, easily available. We might not have imagined electronic books either. So I don't know, maybe not. Um, so technology transfer would have been slowed down uh, if you didn't have trade. And with the, the lack of technology transfer, you have lower innovation. With the lack of, of idea transfer, ideas being transmitted through oral or written texts, uh, people, you know, are kind of left to their own devices and maybe connecting the dots between different ideas becomes not quite as available. And so there's not as much of a thriving, growing, uh, innovative, creative kind of civilization. And I think an example of, of how that might work is that early on in, in Eurasian civilization, from China uh, all the way to Western Europe, you know, a piece of technology that's common in the very early stages of that civilization is the wheel. So with a wheel, you can make a cart. And with a cart, you can have a chariot, which you can fight war with, or you can have a wagon, which you can carry goods with. Or, you know, the wheel becomes really fundamental in, in, in all aspects of, of life throughout Eurasia, uh, down into Africa, because Africa is connected. But in the New World, in the Americas, uh, there's no development of the wheel as a, as a as a piece of technology that one would use to transport things with. So there are examples of wheels and children's toys, but apparently nobody ever thought to, to take that toy and like think about it on a larger scale and develop this, this, this piece of technology that would allow there to be carts and wagons and ultimately automobiles and, and, and gears on machines and all the things that the wheel enabled. But in the Americas, without that, 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 initial idea and then the exchange of that idea and the further development of it as people go across trade routes and say, oh, that, that, that's the way they're using a wheel? Imagine that. We'll take that idea back with us. Um, without that, not as much technological growth, not as much thriving. Okay, so the last question I want to answer is the question related to uh, slavery and trade. And so, you know, somebody asked, when did the first exchange of people happen? Well, I think that's probably lost to history. I mean, Slavery is a very ancient practice. Uh, slavery happens, the, the exchange of people happens through warfare, certainly, and probably that goes way back into maybe like, you know, the time when Homo sapiens and, and, and Homo sapiens Neanderthalus were competing against each other, where, you know, conflict between communities might lead to the enslavement of people. Certainly we see oftentimes uh, women enslaved through warfare. You know, the, the, the men who could fight back are killed, the uh, women and young children are taken into slavery. Um, so certainly that, that goes way back into prehistory, like way back into prehistory. So, you know, when was the first time? I don't know. When was the first person sort of sold, uh, you know, for an exchange of money? I don't know. That's, that's too old as well. Um, but one thing I want to point out is that we do see the exchange of people for money in a, in, in a legal way. We do see, I think, 
uh, a kind of slavery, the, the selling of a person to another person uh, in exchange for goods happening in marriage culture. So throughout the world, in ancient times, uh, young women were exchanged for, um, for a dowry uh, or for some kind of bride price. And so, you know, the woman is, uh, is perhaps given some gifts by her own family or by the, the family that's, that is, uh, or by her own family, sent away to be with her husband. The family of the husband sends then, you know, 30 cows or you know, sheep or, you know, uh, various products or, or money for a bride price. And in that exchange, uh, that woman is transferred. And so that's marriage. But, you know, maybe it's also the selling of a woman into a life of, of, of labor, uh, of giving birth to children, uh, of taking care of the home and all of those sorts of things. And so some would argue that maybe that is an example of slavery, and there were certainly ex economic exchanges going on there in ways that they don't happen in our society today in ways that we observe. So anyway, that might be an answer to that. It's kind of an odd answer, but it's worth thinking about. All right, so it's been a pleasure. Uh, so if you find value in these videos, I would love for you to uh, subscribe to them, to click the like button. Uh, down below and uh, I will catch you next week when we have another meaning in history. Thanks much. Goodbye.